All right, let's go ahead and go to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we're going to be at in our Victory in Jesus Bible study. And we're going to specifically over the next few weeks be uh, looking at finding victory in Jesus and uh, uh, in the area of having victory over adversity. And tonight we're going to talk about the commonality of trials. The commonality of trials. 1 Peter 4 Starting in verse 12, going down to verse uh, 15, Peter starts out here where he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. By way of introduction, suffering is the heritage of the bad, of the penitent, and even of the Son of God. Each one ends at the cross. The bad thief is crucified. The penitent thief is crucified. The Son of God is crucified. By these signs, we know the widespread heritage of suffering. And that quote comes from Oswald Chambers in his book called Christian Discipline. So in the first century, the church in in those days were, were facing trials. And these trials were common For God's people. In fact, Peter writes in his passage that's before us tonight that it is not a rare thing, but rather a common thing for fiery trials to come. As uh, as we go through life, we're going to face adversity, and sometimes when we face that adversity, uh, we don't always know how to react. We we don't always know what's coming, and and it feels different, and and it's not expected, but. Peter's writing this and, and telling us that uh, it's not a, the, life, the Christian life is not a bed of roses. It is one where adversity is going to come. In fact, we, we should expect it. Um, in fact, anybody that, that I've ever talked to about baptism or about discipleship, I've told them when they've made that decision, I've told them this week you need to be ready because you're going to probably face adversity just because you're making this decision. We had a young man in our college ministry that he hadn't been baptized. He'd been going to church for a while, and in our uh, in our uh, discipleship section, and he wanted to be discipled. He came and wanted to be discipled, so we actually went through baptism. That that section that talks about that in in our material that, that we have used here, where baptism's mentioned there. And I didn't tell him you need to get baptized. We just went over the the verses, went over the lesson. And, and he came back to me the next week and says, I need to get baptized. Who do I need to talk to about that? So I directed him to the pastor and I told, the, I told this young man, I said, you're going to have some, probably have some trials this week. Just be ready and expect it. And turned out he used to work at Penny's at the Battlefield Mall in Springfield. And he came to me. He said, how did you know that this was going to happen? Because I said, what exactly happened? And he told me how, how rough of a week that he had at work and all sorts of problems. And, and I said, when you, when you make a decision to follow the Lord, there, there's trials that, that may sometimes come with that. And I said I, I said, I didn't have a crystal ball. I just know Scripture tells us that adversity is going to come. So as we define adversity, it is like a rock hitting the surface of a pond. Immediately, the calm surface is di- disrupted by the percussion of the rock hitting the calm surface, sending out ripples from the point of impact where it goes throughout the entire pond. You ever done that when you've, maybe not so much when you, I used to take and skip little rocks, but, but when I was a kid, it used to aggravate my dad when we'd go fishing. Because sometimes I'd see a big rock and I just th- would think it needs to get, you're, you're laughing because you either either done it or you have some kids that have done it. And I just thought that big rock needed to be thrown in there. And he said, that scares away the fish. Well, 
I throw this big rock in there and the water would splash and send these waves all, all throughout the pond we were fishing on. And adversity is kind of the same way. So we're going to focus on verse 12 primarily tonight on the commonality of trials. And the first point for study is that adversity is expected in the life of a Christian. Adversity is expected in the life of a Christian. When we, we look at the first part here, he says, Beloved. So we know he's talking to believers when he says, Beloved. He's not addressing the whole world. He's not writing to unbelievers. We, we see here when he talks about Beloved. When, when you get saved, the Bible talks about you are part of the Beloved. So he's addressing believers here when he says, Beloved. He says, Think it not strange. So to define the word strange here is that uh, the word strange is defined as to surprise or to astonish by the strangeness or novelty of a thing. Peter is telling Christians to expect the trial. Fiery trials and painful ordeals aptly describe what was what most of us must pass through at one time in this life or another. Some more frequently than others. So the next point that we're going to look at is fiery trials. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials. So we see fiery trials here are defined. Uh, these fiery trials are referenced to are the refiner's fire. When a, when a metal is refined, it is purified by putting heat to it so to burn off uh, all the dirt, the dross and impurities and leave behind pure metal. Uh, when, when a diamond's mine, first mined, it's not... When I was a kid, and, and you, you, you have this, these weird ideas in your mind as a kid, I used to think when they'd, they would strike diamond or they'd strike gold, it would shine the moment you get you know, the rock away from it. And it really, when it gets mined, uh, it, it doesn't look like it does in a jewelry store. It has to go through that, that process of getting all those impurities uh, out in order to do that. So the Lord allows these adversities into our lives to purge out Impurities. In other words, this is God's means of maturing and growing our faith and walk with Him. It's kind of like, uh, with, without mentioning names, uh, we've prayed for particular individuals and particular situations. And I think you, you know which situations that I'm talking about that where we've not necessarily prayed that God get them out of that situation, but that God would use what He needs to to bring them back to Him. And uh, that, that's kind of a little bit of what we're talking about tonight. A, a clay pot sitting in the sun will always be a clay pot. It has to go through the white heat of the furnace to become porcelain. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12-13, Yea, and all that will live godly in Jesus Christ. So he's saying here, look, to live godly in Jesus Christ, here's what's going to happen. And listen to these next three words. Shall suffer persecution. That's not always pleasant when we're talking about following the Lord. Uh, sometimes when we're witnessing to people, that's not necessarily the first thing we want to point people to. But when someone decides to trust Christ, this, this is an elementary doctrine in some ways, I believe, that we need to make sure people realize, hey, when, when you get saved, Satan's got a bullseye on you. He's gonna, he, he knows that he cannot take you out of the hand of God, but he's going to do everything he can to make you uh, live less as a Christian than, than your potential would allow. Uh, he goes on, uh, Paul goes on to say here, but evil men, in verse 13 here of 2 Timothy 3, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So he's talking here about evil compounding itself here. At the age of six, a young man named Daniel fell off some playground equipment and hit his head. Fearing that this young man had a concussion, his aunt, who was a nurse, took care of him and woke him up every hour of the night. And she would say, what's your name? What's your name? And he, and he would answer Daniel. By the middle of the night, Daniel was tired of all these interruptions of his aunt coming in to check on him. When she came in at 5 a.m., she saw something strange on his forehead. And she wondered what was on his forehead. And she looked real closely and got real close to his forehead. And in red crown, it was written over his head, My name is Daniel. We need to remember tonight that adversity is a proof of salvation. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 28-29, through 29, And in nothing... 
terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an event token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is on the behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. We don't have to worry a whole lot about that here in America, in the United States of America. But I know in other countries, this is a reality when people trust Christ. And and we've read missionary testimonies of this. And of, uh, for example, uh, a Christian in Korea forced to leave her home. That's one example that I've I've read about recently. Other examples are, uh, I've heard of people that are Muslims that have gotten saved. And their whole family disowns them, sends them out. Totally opposite. I know everybody here tonight, if you had a family member get saved, you would rejoice with them. You would feel like you have more in common with them. You, that's something you would celebrate. You would, you would be so encouraging. You would embrace them. You would be so happy. And it would be something that's celebrated. But rather, there's some people that when uh, they get saved or, or even begin to take first steps as a Christian and trying to obey God and setting their house in order and, and maybe doing some things that they weren't doing before, trying to put away some things uh, that they were doing because they know that that's not what God wants. They know it's, there's not good consequences to it. And uh, they receive persecution of it. And not in the sense of being burned at the cross or burned at a stake, but, but sometimes our persecution comes sometimes in a snide remark that we get or, or sometimes the rejection we feel. But uh, uh, one of the things that tonight that we need to understand that rejection, persecution, th- these are common things. Uh, tonight that we need to understand that trials are common. And while your trial looks different than mine and mine looks different than yours, is that we all have trials. And that's part of uh, being here for a prayer meeting tonight, praying together, even if it's just a handful, understanding that uh, uh, we need to support one another, particularly in prayer through those trials. And I'm going to stop there for tonight.